Section 55 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Desraeli. Buckingham's Political Coquetry with the Puritans. Buckingham, observes Hume, quote, in order to fortify himself against the resentment of James, end quote, on the conduct of the Duke in the Spanish match, when James was latterly hearing every day Buckingham against Bristol, and Bristol against Buckingham, quote, had affected popularity and entered into the cabals of the Puritans, but afterwards, being secure of the confidence of Charles, he had since abandoned this party, and on that account was the more exposed to their hatred and resentment. End quote. The political coquetry of a minister coalescing with an opposition party, when he was on the point of being disgraced, would doubtless open an involved scene of intrigue, and what one exacted, and the other was content to yield, towards the mutual accommodation, might add one more example to the large chapter of political infirmity. Both workmen attempting to convert each other into tools, by first trying their respective malleability on the anvil, are liable to be disconcerted by even a slight accident, whenever that proves, to perfect conviction, how little they can depend on each other, and that each party comes to cheat, and not to be cheated. This piece of secret history is in part recoverable from good authority. The two great actors were the Duke of Buckingham, and Dr. Preston, the master of Emmanuel College, and the head of the Puritan party. Dr. Preston was an eminent character, who from his youth was not without ambition. His scholastic learning, the subtlety of his genius, and his more elegant accomplishments, had attracted the notice of James, at whose table he was perhaps more than once honored as a guest. A suspicion of his puritanic principles was perhaps the only obstacle to his court preferment, yet Preston unquestionably designed to play a political part. He retained the favor of James by the king's hope of withdrawing the doctor from the opposition party, and commanded the favor of Buckingham by the fears of that minister, when, to employ the quaint style of Hackett, the duke foresaw that, quote, he might come to be tried in the furnace of the next sessions of Parliament, and he had need to make the refiners his friends. End quote. Most of these refiners were the Puritanic or opposition party. Appointed one of the chaplains of Prince Charles, Dr. Preston had the advantage of being in frequent attendance, and as Hackett tells us, quote, This politic man felt the pulse of the court and wanted not the intelligence of all dark mysteries through the scotch in his highness's bedchamber End quote. a close communication took place between the duke and preston who as hackett describes was quote, a good crow to smell carrion End quote. he obtained an easy admission to the duke's closet at least thrice a week and their notable conferences buckingham appears to have communicated to his confidential friends preston intent on carrying all his points skillfully commenced with the smaller ones he winded the duke circuitously he worked at him subterraneously this wary politician was too sagacious to propose what he had at heart the extirpation of the hierarchy the thunder of james's voice quote, no bishop, no king, end quote, in the conference at Hampton Court, still echoed in the ear of the Puritan. He assured the Duke 
that the love of the people was his only anchor which could only be secured by the most popular measures a new sort of reformation was easy to execute cathedrals and collegiate colleges cathedrals and collegiate churches maintained by vast wealth and the lands of the chapter only fed quote, fat lazy and unprofitable drones end quote. the dissolution of the foundations of deans and chapters would open an ample source to pay the king's debts and scatter the streams of patronage quote, you would then become the darling of the commonwealth end quote. i give the words as i find them in hackett quote, if a crumb stick in the throat of any considerable man that attempts an opposition it will be easy to wash it down with manners woods royalties tithes etc End quote. it would be furnishing the wants of a number of gentlemen and he quoted a greek proverb quote, that when a great oak falls every neighbor may scuffle for a faggot End quote. dr preston was willing to perform the part which knox had acted in scotland he might have been certain of a party to maintain this national violation of property for he who calls out plunder will ever find a gang these acts of national injustice so much desired by revolutionists are never beneficial to the people they never partake of the spoliation and the whole terminates in the gratification of private rapacity it was not however easy to obtain such perpetual access to the minister and at the same time escape from the watchful archbishop williams the lord keeper got sufficient hints from the king and in a tedious conference with the duke he wished to convince him that preston had only offered him quote, flit and milk out of which he should churn nothing end quote. the duke was however smitten by the new project and made a remarkable answer quote, you lose yourself in generalities make it out to me in particular if you can that the motion you pick at will find repulse and be baffled in the house of commons i know not how you bishops may struggle but i am much deluded if a great part of the knights and burgesses will not be glad to see this alteration End quote. We are told on this that Archbishop Williams took out a list of the members of the House of Commons and convinced the minister that an overwhelming majority would oppose this projected revolution, and that in consequence the Duke gave it up. But this anterior decision of the Duke may be doubtful, since Preston still retained the high favor of the minister after the death of James. When James died at Tybalds, where dr preston happened to be in attendance he had the honour of returning to town in the new king's coach with the duke of buckingham the doctor's servile adulation of the minister gave even great offence to the overzealous puritans that he was at length discarded is certain but this was owing not to any deficient subserviency on the side of our politician but to one of those unlucky circumstances which have often put an end to temporary political connections by enabling one party to discover what the other thinks of him i draw this curious fact from a manuscript narrative in the handwriting of the learned william watton when the puritanic party foolishly became jealous of the man who seemed to be working at root and branch for their purposes they addressed a letter to preston remonstrating with him for his servile attachment to the minister on which he confidently returned an answer assuring them that he was as fully convinced of the vileness and profligacy of the duke of buckingham's character as any man could be but that there was no way to come at him but by the lowest flattery and that it was necessary for the glory of god that such instruments should be made use of as could be had and for that reason and that alone he showed that respect to the reigning favorite and not for any real honor that he had for him this letter proved fatal 
some officious hand conveyed it to the duke when preston came as usual the duke took his opportunity of asking him what he had ever done to disoblige him that he should describe him in such black characters to his own party preston in amazement denied the fact and poured forth professions of honour and gratitude the duke showed him his own letter dr preston instantaneously felt a political apoplexy the labours of some years were lost in a single morning the baffled politician was turned out of wallingford house never more to see the enraged minister and from that moment buckingham wholly abandoned the puritans and cultivated the friendship of laud this happened soon after james the first's death watton adds quote, this story i had from one who was extremely well versed in the secret history of the time End quote. footnote watton delivered this memorandum to the literary antiquary thomas baker and kennett transcribed it in his manuscript collections lands down manuscript number nine three two dash eight eight the life of dr preston in chalmers biographical dictionary may be consulted with advantage end of footnote end of section fifty five recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Chapter fifty six of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Curiosities of Literature, Volume three by Isaac Disraeli. Sir Edward Coke's Exceptions Against the High Sheriff's Oath. A curious fact will show the revolutionary nature of human events and the necessity of correcting our ancient statutes, which so frequently hold out punishments and penalties for objects which have long ceased to be criminal, as well as for persons against whom it would be barbarous to allow some unrepealed statute to operate. When a political stratagem was practiced by Charles I to keep certain members out of the House of Commons by pricking them down as sheriffs in their different counties, among them was the celebrated Sir Edward Coke, whom the government had made high sheriff for bucks. It was necessary, perhaps, to be a learned and practiced lawyer to discover the means he took, in the height of his resentment, to elude the insult this great lawyer who himself perhaps had often administered the oath to the sheriffs which had century after century been usual for them to take to the surprise of all persons drew up exceptions against the sheriff's oath declaring that no one could take it coke sent his exceptions to the attorney-general who by an immediate order in council submitted them to all the judges of england our legal luminary had condescended only to some ingenious cavilling in three of his exceptions but the fourth was of a nature which could not be overcome all the judges of england assented and declared that there was one part of this ancient oath which was perfectly irreligious and must ever hereafter be left out this article was that you shall do all your pain and diligence to destroy and make to cease all manner of heresies commonly called lolleries within your bellowick and sea the lollards were the most ancient of protestants and had practised luther's sentiments it was in fact condemning the established religion of the country an order was issued from hampton court for the abrogation of this part of the oath and at present all high sheriffs owe this obligation to the resentment of sir edward coke for having been pricked down as sheriff of bucks to be kept out of parliament the merit of having the oath changed instanter he was allowed but he was not excused taking it after it was accommodated to the conscientious and lynx-eyed detection of our enraged lawyer End of section fifty six
Section fifty seven of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. Curiosities of Literature, Volume three, by Isaac Disraeli. Secret History of Charles I and His First Parliaments. Part One. The reign of Charles I, succeeded by the Commonwealth of England, forms a period unparalleled by any preceding one in the annals of mankind. It was for the English nation, the great result of all former attempts to ascertain and to secure the just freedom of the subject. The prerogative of the sovereign and the rights of the people were often imagined to be mutual encroachments and were long involved in contradiction in an age of unsettled opinions and disputed principles at length the conflicting parties of monarchy and democracy in the weakness of their passions discovered how much each required the other for its protector this age offers the finest speculations in human nature it opens a protracted scene of glory and of infamy all that elevates and all that humiliates our kind wrestling together and expiring in a career of glorious deeds of revolting crimes and even of ludicrous infirmities the french revolution is the commentary of the english and a commentary at times more important than the text which it elucidates it has thrown a freshness over the antiquity of our own history and on returning to it we seem to possess the feelings and to be agitated by the interests of contemporaries the circumstances and the persons which so many imagine had passed away have been reproduced under our own eyes in other histories we accept the knowledge of the characters and the incidents on the evidence of the historian but here we may take them from our own conviction since to extinct names and to past events we can apply the reality which we ourselves have witnessed charles i had scarcely ascended the throne ere he discovered that in his new parliament he was married to a sullen bride the youthful monarch with the impatience of a lover warm with hope and glory was ungraciously repulsed even in the first favours the prediction of his father remained like the handwriting on the wall but seated on the throne hope was more congenial to youth than prophecy as soon as charles i could assemble a parliament he addressed them with an earnestness in which the simplicity of words and thoughts strongly contrasted with the oratical harangues of the late monarch it cannot be alleged against charles i that he preceded the parliament in the war of words he courted their affections and even in this manner of reception amidst the dignity of the regal office studiously showed his exterior respect by the marked solemnity of their first meeting as yet uncrowned on the day on which he first addressed the lords and commons he wore his crown and veiled it at the opening and on the close of his speech a circumstance to which the parliament had not been accustomed another ceremony gave still greater solemnity to the meeting the king would not enter into business till they had united in prayer he commanded the doors to be closed and a bishop to perform the office the suddenness of this unexpected command disconcerted the catholic lords of whom the less rigid knelt and the moderate stood there was one startled papist who did nothing but cross himself the speech may be found in rushworth the friendly tone must be shown here i hope that you do remember that you were pleased to employ me to advise my father to break off the treaties with spain i came into this business willingly and freely like a young man and consequently rashly but it was by your interest your engagement i pray you to remember that this being my first action and begun by your advice and entreaty what a great dishonour it were to you and me that it should fail for that assistance you are able to give me this effusion excited no sympathy in the house they voted not a seventh part of the expenditure necessary to proceed with a war into which as a popular measure they themselves had forced the king at oxford the king again reminded them that he was engaged in a war 
from their desires and advice he expresses his disappointment at their insufficient grant far short to set forth the navy now preparing the speech preserves the same simplicity still no echo of kindness responded in the house it was however asserted in a vague and quibbling manner that though a former parliament did engage the king in a war yet if things were managed by a contrary design and the treasure misemployed this parliament is not bound by another parliament and they added a cruel mockery that the king should help the cause of the palatinate with his own money this foolish war which james and charles had so long borne their reproaches for having avoided as hopeless but which the puritanic party as well as others had continually urged as necessary for the maintenance of the protestant cause in europe still no supplies but protestations of duty and petitions about grievances which it had been difficult to specify in their declaration they style his majesty our dear and dread sovereign and themselves his poor commons but they concede no point they offer no aid the king was not yet disposed to quarrel though he had in vain pressed for dispatch of business lest the season should be lost for the navy again reminding them that it was the first request that he ever made unto them on the pretence of the plague at oxford charles prorogued parliament with a promise to reassemble in the winter there were a few whose hearts had still a pulse to vibrate with the distresses of a youthful monarch perplexed by a war which they themselves had raised but others of a more republican complexion rejected necessity as a dangerous counsellor which would always be furnishing arguments for supplies if the king was in danger and necessity those ought to answer for it who have put both king and kingdom into this peril and if the state of things would not admit a redress of grievances there cannot be so much necessity for money the first parliament abandoned the king charles now had no other means to dispatch the army and fleet in a bad season but by borrowing money on privy seals these were letters where the loan exacted was as small as the style was humble they specified that this loan without inconvenience to any is only intended for the service of the public such private helps for public services which cannot be deferred the king premises had often been resorted to but this being the first time that we have required anything in this kind we require but that sum which few men would deny a friend as far as i can discover the highest sum assessed from great personages was twenty pounds the king was willing to suffer any mortification even that of a charitable solicitation rather than endure the obdurate insults of parliament all donations were received from ten pounds to five shillings this was the mockery of an alms basket yet with contributions and savings so trivial and exacted with such a warm appeal to their feelings was the king to send out a fleet with ten thousand men to take cadiz this expedition like so many similar attempts from the days of charles i to those of the great lord chatham and to our own concluded in a nullity charles disappointed in this predatory attempt in despair called his second parliament as he says in the midst of his necessities and to learn from them how he was to frame his course and counsels the commons as duteously as ever professed that no king was ever dearer to his people and that they really intend to assist his majesty in such a way as may make him safe at home and feared abroad but it was to be on condition that he would be graciously pleased to accept the information and advice of parliament in discovering the causes of the great evils and redress their grievances the king accepted this as a satisfactory answer but charles comprehended their drift you specially aim at the duke of buckingham what he hath done to change your minds i wot not the style of the king now first betrays angered feelings the secret cause of the uncomplying conduct of the commons was hatred of the favourite but the king saw that they were designed to control the executive government and he could ascribe their antipathy to buckingham but to the capriciousness of popular favour 
for not long ago he had heard buckingham hailed as their saviour in the zeal and firmness of his affections charles always considered that he himself was aimed at in the person of his confidant his companion and his minister some of the bold speakers as the heads of the opposition are frequently designated in the manuscript letters have now risen into notice sir john elliot dr turner sir dudley diggs mr clement coke poured themselves forth in a vehement not to say seditious style with invectives more daring than had ever before thundered in the house of commons the king now told them i come to show your errors and as i may call it unparliamentary proceedings of parliament the lord keeper then assured them that when the irregular humours of some particular persons were settled the king would hear and answer all just grievances but the king would have them also to know that he was equally jealous to the contempt of his royal rights which his majesty would not suffer to be violated by any pretended course of parliamentary liberty the king considered the parliament as his counsel but there was a difference between counselling and controlling and between liberty and the abuse of liberty he finished by noticing their extraordinary proceedings in their impeachment of buckingham the king resuming his speech remarkably reproached the parliament now that you have all things according to your wishes and that i am so far engaged that you think that there is no retreat now you begin to set the dice and make your own game but i pray you be not deceived it is not a parliamentary way nor is it a way to deal with a king mr clement coke told you it was better to be eaten up by a foreign enemy than to be destroyed at home indeed i think it more honour for a king to be invaded and almost destroyed by a foreign enemy than to be despised by his own subjects the king concluded by asserting his privilege to call or to forbid parliaments the style of the bold speakers appeared at least as early as in april i trace their spirit in letters of the times which furnish facts and expressions that do not appear in our printed documents among the earliest of our patriots and finally the great victim of his exertions was sir john elliot vice-admiral of devonshire he in a tone which rolled back to jove his own bolts and startled even the writer who was himself biased to the popular party made a resolute i doubt whether a timely speech he adds elliot asserted that they came not thither either to do what the king should command them nor to abstain when he forbade them they came to continue constant and to maintain their privileges they would not give their posterity a cause to curse them for losing their privileges by restraint which their forefathers had left them on the eighth of may the impeachment of the duke was opened by sir dudley diggs who compared the duke to a meteor exhaled out of putrid matter he was followed by glanville selden and others on this first day the duke sat out facing his accusers and out braving their accusations which the more highly exasperated the house footnote the king had said in his speech to parliament i must let you know i will not allow any of my servants to be questioned among you much less such as are of eminent place and near unto me hence the security of buckingham who showed the most perfect contempt for the speakers who thus violently attacked him End of footnote on the following day the duke was absent when the epilogue to this mighty piece was elaborately delivered by sir john elliot with a force of declamation and a boldness of personal allusion which have not been surpassed in the invectives of the modern junius elliot after expatiating on the favourite's ambition in procuring and getting into his hands the greatest offices of strength and power in the kingdom and the means by which he had obtained them drew a picture of the inward character of the duke's mind the duke's plurality of offices reminded him of a chimerical beast called by the ancients stellionatus so blurred so spotted so full of foul lines that they knew not what to make of it in setting up himself he hath set upon the kingdom's revenues the fountain of supply and the nerves of the land he intercepts 
consumes and exhausts the revenues of the crown and by emptying the veins the blood should run in he hath cast the kingdom into a high consumption he descends to criminate the duke's magnificent tastes he who had something of a congenial nature for eliot was a man of fine literature infinite sums of money and mass of land exceeding the value of money contributions in parliament have been heaped upon him and how have they been employed upon costly furniture sumptuous feasting and magnificent building the visible evidence of the express exhausting of the state eliot eloquently closes your lordships have an idea of the man what he is in himself what in his affections you have seen his power and some i fear have felt it you have known his practice and have heard the effects being such what is he in reference to king and state how compatible or incompatible with either in reference to the king he must be styled the canker in his treasure in reference to the state the moth of all goodness i can hardly find him a parallel but none were so like him as sejanus who is described by tacitus audax sui abtegens in alios criminator juxta adolatio et superbia sejanus's pride was so excessive as tacitus saith that he neglected all counsels mixed his business and service with the prince seeming to confound their actions and was often styled imperatoris laborum socius doth not this man the like ask england scotland and ireland and they will tell you how lately and how often hath this man commixed his actions and discourses with actions of the kings my lords i have done you see the man the parallel of the duke with sejanus electrified the house and as we shall see touched charles on a convulsive nerve the king's conduct on this speech was the beginning of his troubles and the first of his more open attempts to crush the popular party in the house of lords the king defended the duke and informed them i have thought fit to take order for the punishing some insolent speeches lately spoken i find a piece of secret history enclosed in a letter with a solemn injunction that it might be burnt the king this morning complained of sir john eliot for comparing the duke to sejanus in which he said implicitly he must intend me for tiberius on that day the prologue and the epilogue orators sir dudley diggs who had opened the impeachment against the duke and sir john eliot who had closed it were called out of the house by two messengers who showed their warrants for committing them to the tower footnote our printed historical documents canet franklin and company are confused in their details and facts seem misplaced for want of dates they all equally copy rushworth the only source of our history of this period even hume is involved in the obscurity the king's speech was on the eleventh of may as rushworth has not furnished dates it would seem that the two orators had been sent to the tower before the king's speech to the lord End of footnote. on this memorable day a philosophical politician might have presciently marked the seed-plots of events which not many years afterwards were apparent to all men the passions of kings are often expatiated on but in the present anti-monarchical period the passions of parliaments are not imaginable the democratic party in our constitution from the meanest of motives from their egotism their vanity and their audacity hate kings they would have an abstract being a chimerical sovereign on the throne like a statue the mere ornament of the place it fills and insensible like a statue to the invectives they would heap upon its pedestal the commons with a fierce spirit of reaction for the king's punishing some insolent speeches at once sent up to the lords for the commitment of the duke footnote the king attended the house of lords to explain his intentions verbally taking the minister with him though under impeachment touching the matters against him 
said the king, I myself can be a witness to clear him in every one of them. End of footnote. But when they learnt the fate of the patriots, they instantaneously broke up. In the afternoon, they assembled in Westminster Hall to interchange their private sentiments on the fate of the two imprisoned members, in sadness and indignation. Footnote. They decided on stopping all business till satisfaction was given them, which ended in the release of Diggs and Elliot in a few days. End of footnote. The following day the commons met by their own house. When the speaker reminded them of the usual business, they all cried out, Sit down, sit down. They would touch on no business till they were righted in their liberties. Footnote. Franklin, an inveterate royalist, in copying Rushworth, inserts their pretended liberties, exactly the style of Catholic writers when they mention Protestantism by la région prétendue réformée. All party writers use the same style. End of footnote. An open committee of the whole house was formed, and no member suffered to quit the house, but either they were at a loss how to commence this solemn conference, or express their indignation by a sullen silence. To soothe and subdue the bold speakers was the unfortunate attempt of the vice-chamberlain, Sir Dudley Carleton, who had long been one of our foreign ambassadors, and who, having witnessed the despotic governments on the continent, imagined that there was no deficiency of liberty at home. I find, said the vice-chamberlain, by the great silence in this house, that it is a fit time to be heard, if you will grant me the patience. Alluding to one of the king's messages, where it was hinted that, if there was no correspondency between him and the parliament, he should be forced to use new councils. I pray you consider what these new councils are and may be. I fear to declare those I conceive. However, Sir Dudley plainly hinted at them, when he went on observing that, when monarchs began to know their own strength, and saw the turbulent spirit of their parliaments, they had overthrown them in all Europe except here only with us. Our old ambassador drew an amusing picture of the effects of despotic governments in that of France. If you knew the subjects in foreign countries as well as myself, to see them look, not like our nation, with store of flesh on their backs, but like so many ghosts, and not men, being nothing but skin and bones, with some thin cover to their nakedness, and wearing only wooden shoes on their feet, so that they cannot eat meat, or wear good clothes, but they must pay their king for it. This is a misery beyond expression, and that which we are yet free from. A long residence abroad had deprived Sir Dudley Carleton of any sympathy with the high tone of freedom, and the proud jealousy of their privileges, which, though yet unascertained, undefined, and still often contested, was breaking forth among the commons of England. It was fated that the celestial spirit of our national freedom should not descend among us in the form of the mystical dove. Hume observes on this speech that these imprudent suggestions rather gave warning than struck terror. It was evident that the event, which implied new councils, meant what subsequently was practiced, the king governing without a parliament. As for the ghosts who wore wooden shoes, to which the house was congratulated that they had not yet been reduced, they would infer that it was more necessary to provide against the possibility of such strange apparitions. Hume truly observes, the king reaped no further benefit from this attempt than to exasperate the house still further. Some words which the duke persisted in asserting had dropped from Diggs were explained away, Diggs declaring that they had not been used by him, and it seems probable that he was suffered to eat his words. Elliot was made of sterner stuff. He abated not a jot of whatever he had spoken of that man, as he affected to call Buckingham. The commons, whatever might be their patriotism, seem at first to have been chiefly moved by a personal hatred of the favorite, and their real charges against him amounted to little more than pretenses and aggravations. Footnote. 
the strength of the popular hatred may be seen in the articles on buckingham and felton in volume two satires in manuscript abounded and by their broad-spoken pungency rendered the duke a perfect bete noire to the people End of footnote. the king whose personal affections were always strong considered his friend innocent and there was a warm romantic feature in the character of the youthful monarch which scorned to sacrifice his faithful companion to his own interests and to emollient the minister to the clamours of the commons subsequently when the king did this in the memorable case of the guiltless strafford it was the only circumstance which weighed on his mind at the hour of his own sacrifice sir robert cotton told a friend on the day on which the king went down to the house of lords and committed the two patriots that he had of late been often sent for to the king and duke and that the king's affection towards him was very admirable and no whit lessened certainly he added the king will never yield to the duke's fall being a young man resolute magnanimous and tenderly and firmly affectionate where he takes this authentic character of charles the first by that intelligent and learned man to whom the nation owes the treasures of its antiquities is remarkable sir robert cotton though holding no rank at court and in no respect of the duke's party was often consulted by the king and much in his secrets how the king valued the judgment of this acute and able adviser acting on it in direct contradiction to the mortification of the favourite i shall probably have occasion to show the commons did not decline in the subtle spirit with which they had begun they covertly aimed at once to subjugate the sovereign and to expel the minister a remonstrance was prepared against the levying of tonnage and poundage which constituted half of the crown revenues and a petition equivalent to a command for removing buckingham from his majesty's person and councils the remonstrance is wrought up with a high spirit of invective against the unbridled ambition of the duke whom they class among those vipers and pests to their king and commonwealth as so expressly styled by your most royal father they request that he would be pleased to remove this person from access to his sacred presence and that he would not balance this one man with all these things and with the affairs of the christian world the king hastily dissolved this second parliament and when the lords petitioned for its continuance he warmly and angrily exclaimed not a moment longer it was dissolved in june 1626 the patriots abandoned their sovereign to his fate and retreated home sullen indignant and ready to conspire among themselves for the assumption of their disputed or their defrauded liberties they industriously dispersed their remonstrance and the king replied by a declaration but an attack is always more vigorous than a defence the declaration is spiritless and evidently composed under suppressed feelings which perhaps knew not how to shape themselves the remonstrance was commanded everywhere to be burnt and the effect which it produced on the people we shall shortly witness the king was left amidst the most pressing exigencies at the dissolution of the first parliament he had been compelled to practice a humiliating economy hume has alluded to the numerous wants of the young monarch but he certainly was not acquainted with the king's extreme necessities his coronation seemed rather a private than a public ceremony to save the expenses of the procession from the tower through the city to whitehall that customary pomp was omitted and the reason alleged was to save the charge for more noble undertakings that is for means to carry on the spanish war without supplies but now the most extraordinary changes appeared at court the king mortgaged his lands in cornwall to the aldermen and companies of london a rumour spread that the small pension list must be revoked and the royal distress was carried so far that all the tables at court were laid down and the courtiers put on board wages i have seen a letter which gives an account of the funeral supper at whitehall whereat twenty-three tables were buried being from henceforth converted to board wages and there i learn that since this dissolving of housekeeping 
his majesty is but slenderly attended another writer who describes himself to be only a looker-on regrets that while the men of the law spent ten thousand pounds on a single mask they did not rather make the king rich and adds i see a rich commonwealth a rich people and the crown poor this strange poverty of the court of charles seems to have escaped the notice of our general historians charles was now to victual his fleet with the savings of board wages for this surplusage was taken into account the fatal descent on the isle of ray sent home buckingham discomfited and spread dismay through the nation the best blood had been shed from the wanton bravery of an unskilled and romantic commander who forced to retreat would march but not fly and was the very last man to quit the ground which he could not occupy in the eagerness of his hopes buckingham had once dropped as i learn that before midsummer he should be more honoured and beloved by the commons than ever was the earl of essex and thus he rocked his own and his master's imagination in cradling fancies this volatile hero who had felt the capriciousness of popularity thought that it was as easily regained as it was easily lost and that chivalric adventure would return to him that favour which at this moment might have been denied to all the wisdom the policy and the arts of an experienced statesman the king was now involved in more intricate and desperate measures and the nation was thrown into a state of agitation of which the page of popular history yields but a faint impression the spirit of insurrection was stalking forth in the metropolis and in the country the scenes which i am about to describe occurred at the close of 1626 an inattentive reader might easily mistake them for the revolutionary scenes of 1640 it was an unarmed rebellion an army and a navy had returned unpaid and sore with defeat the town was scoured by mutinous seamen and soldiers roving even into the palace of the sovereign soldiers without pay form a society without laws a band of captains rushed into the duke's apartment as he sat at dinner and when reminded by the duke of a late proclamation forbidding all soldiers coming to court in troops on pain of hanging they replied that whole companies were ready to be hanged with them that the king might do as he pleased with their lives for that their reputation was lost and their honour forfeited for want of their salary to pay their debts when a petition was once presented and it was inquired who was the composer of it a vast body tremendously shouted all all a multitude composed of seamen met at tower hill and set a lad on a scaffold who with an oh yes proclaimed that king charles had promised their pay or the duke had been on the scaffold himself these at least were grievances more apparent to the sovereign than those vague ones so perpetually repeated by his unfaithful commons but what was remained to be done it was only a choice of difficulties between the disorder and the remedy at the moment the duke got up what he called the council of the sea was punctual at its first meeting and appointed three days in a week to sit but broke his appointment the second day they found him always otherwise engaged and the council of the sea turned out to be one of those shadowy expedients which only lasts while it acts on the imagination it is said that thirty thousand pounds would have quieted these disorganized troops but the exchequer could not supply so mean a sum buckingham in despair and profuse of life was planning a fresh expedition for the siege of rochelle a new army was required he swore if there was money in the kingdom it should be had now began that series of contrivances and artifices and persecutions to levy money forced loans or pretended free gifts kindled a resisting spirit it was urged by the court party that the sums required were in fact much less in amount than the usual grants of subsidies but the cry in return for a subsidy was always a parliament many were heavily fined for declaring that they knew no law besides that of parliament to compel men to give away their own goods 
the king ordered that those who would not subscribe to the loans should not be forced but it seems there were orders in council to specify those householders names who would not subscribe and it further appears that those who would not pay in purse should in person those who were pressed to send to the depot but either the soldiers would not receive these good citizens or they found easy means to return every mode which the government invented seems to have been easily frustrated either by the intrepidity of the parties themselves or by that general understanding which enabled the people to play into one another's hands when the common council had consented that an imposition should be laid the citizens called the guild hall the yield all and whenever they levied a distress in consequence of a refusal to pay it nothing was to be found but old ends such as nobody cared for or if a severer officer seized on commodities it was in vain to offer pennyworths where no customer was to be had a wealthy merchant who had formerly been a cheesemonger was summoned to appear before the privy council and required to lend the king two hundred pounds or else to go himself to the army and serve it with cheese it was not supposed that a merchant so aged and wealthy would submit to resume his former mean trade but the old man in the spirit of the times preferred the hard alternative and balked the new project of finance by shipping himself with his cheese at hicks hall the duke and the earl of dorset sat to receive the loans but the duke threatened and the earl affected to treat with levity men who came before them with all the suppressed feelings of popular indignation the earl of dorset asking a fellow who pleaded inability to lend money of what trade he was and being answered a tailor said put down your name for such a sum one snip will make amends for all the tailor quoted scripture abundantly and shook the bench with laughter or with rage by his anathemas till he was put fast to a messenger's hands this was one ball renowned through the parish of st clement's and not only a tailor but a prophet twenty years after tailors and prophets employed messengers themselves footnote the radicals of that day differed from ours in the means though not in the end they at least referred to their bibles and rather more than was required but superstition is as mad as atheism many of the puritans confused their brains with the study of the revelations believing prince henry to be prefigured in the apocalypse some prophecies that he should overthrow the beast ball our tailor was this very prophet and was so honest as to believe in his own prophecy osborne tells that ball put out money on adventure i e to receive it back double or treble when king james should be elected pope so that though he had no money for a loan he had to spare for a prophecy this ball has been confounded with a more ancient radical ball a priest and a principal mover in wat tyler's insurrection our ball has been very notorious for johnson has noticed his admired discourses mr gifford without any knowledge of my account of this tailor prophet by his active sagacity has rightly indicated him see johnson's work volume five page two hundred and forty one end of footnote End of section fifty seven. Recording by Corinne LePage. Section fifty eight of Curiosities of Literature, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Secret History of Charles I and His First Parliaments, Part 2. These are instances drawn from the inferior classes of society, but the same spirit actuated the country gentlemen. One instance represents many. George Gatesby, of Northamptonshire, being committed to prison as a lone recusant, alleged among other reasons for his non-compliance that he considered that this loan might become a precedent and that every precedent he was told by the lord president was a flower of the prerogative the lord president told him that he lied
Gatesby shook his head, observing, I come not here to contend with your lordship, but to suffer. Lord Suffolk, then interposing, entreated the Lord President would not too far urge his kinsman, Mr. Gatesby. This country gentleman waived any kindness he might owe to kindred, declaring that he would remain master of his own purse. The prisons were crowded with these lone recusants, as well as with those who had sinned in the freedom of their opinions. The country gentlemen ensured their popularity by their committals, and many stout resisters of the loans were returned in the following Parliament against their own wishes. Footnote It is curious to observe that the Westminster elections, in the fourth year of Charles's reign, were exactly of the same turbulent character as those which we witness in our days. The Duke had counted by his interest to bring in Sir Robert Pye. The contest was severe, but accompanied by some of those ludicrous electioneering scenes which still amuse the mob. Whenever Sir Robert Pye's party cried, A pie, a pie, a pie! The adverse party would cry, A pudding, a pudding, a pudding! And others, A lie, a lie, a lie! This Westminster election of two hundred years ago ended as we have seen some others. They rejected all who had urged the payment of loans, and, passing by such men as Sir Robert Cotton and their last representative, they fixed on a brewer and a grocer for the two members for Westminster. End of footnote. The friends of these knights and country gentlemen flocked to their prisons, and when they petitioned for more liberty and air during the summer, it was policy to grant their request but it was also policy that they should not reside in their own counties. This relaxation was only granted to those who, living in the south, consented to sojourn in the north, while the dwellers in the north were to be lodged in the south. In the country, the disturbed scenes assumed even a more alarming appearance than in London. They not only would not provide money, but when money was offered by government, the men refused to serve, a conscription was not then known, and it became a question long debated in the Privy Council whether those who would not accept press money should not be tried by martial law. I preserve in the note a curious piece of secret information. Footnote Extract from a manuscript letter On Friday last I hear, but as a secret, that it was debated at the council table whether our Essex men, who refused to take press money, should not be punished by martial law, and hanged up on the next tree to their dwellings, for an example of terror to others. My lord keeper, who had been long silent when, in conclusion, it came to his course to speak, told the lords that, as far as he understood the law, none were liable to martial law but martial men. If these had taken press money and afterwards run from their colours, they might be punished in that manner, but yet... They were no soldiers, and refused to be. Secondly, he thought a subsidy, new by law, could not be pressed against his will for a foreign service. It being supposed, in law, the service of his purse excused that of his person, unless his own country were in danger, and he appealed to my lord treasurer and my lord president whether it was not so, who both assented it was so, though some of them faintly, as unwilling to have been urged to such an answer. So it is thought that proposition is dashed, and it will be tried what may be done in the star chamber against these refractories. End of footnote. The great novelty and symptom of the times was the scattering of letters. Sealed letters addressed to the leading men of the country were found hanging on bushes, anonymous letters were dropped in shops and streets, which gave notice that the day was fast approaching when, such a work was to be wrought in England as never was the like, which will be for our good. Addresses multiplied. To all true-hearted Englishmen. A groom detected in spreading such seditious papers, and brought into the inexorable star chamber, was fined three thousand pounds. The leniency of the punishment was rather regretted by two bishops. If it was ever carried into execution, the unhappy man must have remained a groom, who never after crossed a horse. There is one difficult duty of an historian, which is too often passed over by the party writer. 
it is to pause whenever he feels himself warming with the passions of the multitude or becoming the blind apologist of arbitrary power an historian must transform himself into the characters which he is representing and throw himself back into the times which he is opening possessing himself of their feelings and tracing their actions he may then at least hope to discover truths which may equally interest the honourable men of all parties this reflection has occurred from the very difficulty into which i am now brought shall we at once condemn the king for these arbitrary measures it is however very possible that they were never in his contemplation involved in inextricable difficulties according to his feelings he was betrayed by parliament and he scorned to barter their favour by that vulgar traffic of treachery the immolation of the single victim who had long attached his personal affections a man at least as much envied as hated that hard lesson had not yet been inculcated on a british sovereign that his bosom must be a blank for all private affection and had that lesson been taught the character of charles was destitute of all aptitude for it to reign without a refractory parliament and to find among the people themselves subjects more loyal than their representatives was an experiment and a fatal one under charles the liberty of the subject when the necessities of the state pressed on the sovereign was matter of discussion disputed as often as assumed the divines were proclaiming as rebellious those who refused their contributions to aid the government and the law sages alleged precedents for raising supplies in the manner which charles had adopted footnote a member of the house in james the first's time called this race of divines spaniels to the court and wolves to the people dr mainwaring dr sibthorpe and dean bargrave were seeking for ancient precedents to maintain absolute monarchy and to inculcate passive obedience bargrave had this passage in his sermon it was the speech of a man renowned for wisdom in our age that if he were commanded to put forth to sea in a ship that had neither mast nor tackling he would do it and being asked what wisdom that were replied the wisdom must be in him that hath power to command not in him that conscience binds to obey sibthorpe after he published his sermon immediately had his house burnt down dr mainwaring says a manuscript letter writer sent the other day to a friend of mine to help him to all the ancient precedents he could find to strengthen his opinion for absolute monarchy who answered him he could help him in nothing but only to hang him and that if he lived till a parliament or etc he should be sure of a halter mainwaring afterwards submitted to parliament but after the dissolution got a free pardon the panic of popery was a great evil the divines under laud appeared to approach to catholicism but it was probably only a project of reconciliation between the two churches which elizabeth james and charles equally wished mr cousins a letter writer is censured for superstition in this bitter style mr cousins has impudently made three editions of his prayer book and one which gives him away in private different from the published ones an audacious fellow whom my lord of durham greatly admireth i doubt if he be a sound protestant he was so blind at evensong on candlemas day that he could not see to read prayers in the minster with less than three hundred and forty candles whereof sixty he caused to be placed about the high altar besides he caused the picture of our saviour supported by two angels to be set in the choir the committee is very hot against him no matter if they trounce him this was cousins who survived the revolution and returning with charles the second was raised to the see of durham the charitable institutions he has left are most munificent End of footnote. selden whose learned industry was as vast as the amplitude of his mind had to seek for the freedom of the subject in the dust of the records of the tower and the omnipotence of parliaments if any human assembly may be invested with such supernatural greatness had not yet awakened the hoar antiquity of popular liberty a general spirit of insurrection rather than insurrection itself had suddenly raised some strange appearances through the kingdom 
the remonstrance of parliament had unquestionably quickened the feelings of the people but yet the lovers of peace and the reverencers of royalty were not a few money and men were procured to send out the army and the fleet more concealed causes may be suspected to have been at work many of the heads of the opposition were pursuing some secret machinations about this time i find many mysterious stories indications of secret societies and other evidences of the intrigues of the popular party little matters sometimes more important than they appear are suitable to our minute sort of history in november sixteen twenty six a rumour spread that the king was to be visited by an ambassador from the president of the society of the rosy cross he was indeed a heteroclite ambassador for he is described as a youth with never a hair on his face in fact a child who was to conceal the mysterious personage which he was for a moment to represent he appointed sunday afternoon to come to court attended by thirteen coaches he was to proffer to his majesty provided the king accepted his advice three millions to put in his coffers and by his secret counsels he was to unfold matters of moment and secrecy a latin letter was delivered to david ramsay of the clock to hand over to the king a copy of it has been preserved in a letter of the times but it is so unmeaning that it could have had no effect on the king who however declared that he would not admit him to an audience and that if he could tell where the president of the rosy cross was to be found unless he made good his offer he would hang him at the court gates this served the town and country for talk till the appointed sunday had passed over and no ambassador was visible some considered this as the plotting of crazy brains but others imagined it to be an attempt to speak with the king in private on matters respecting the duke there was also discovered by letters received from rome a whole parliament of jesuits sitting in a fair hanged vault in clerkenwell sir john cook would have alarmed the parliament that on st joseph's day these were to have occupied their places ministers are supposed to sometimes have conspirators for the nonce sir dudley diggs in the opposition as usual would not believe in any such political necromancers but such a party were discovered cook would have insinuated that the french ambassador had persuaded louis that the divisions between charles and his people had been raised by his ingenuity and was reward for the intelligence this is not unlikely after all the parliament of jesuits might have been a secret college of the order for among other things seized on was a considerable library when the parliament was sitting a sealed letter was thrown under the door with this superscription cursed be the man that finds this letter and delivers it not to the house of commons the sergeant-at-arms delivered it to the speaker who would not open it till the house had chosen a committee of twelve members to inform them whether it was fit to be read sir edward coke after having read two or three lines stopped and according to my authority durst read no further but immediately sealing it the committee thought fit to send it to the king who they say on reading it through cast it into the fire and sent the house of commons thanks for their wisdom in not publishing it and for the discretion of the committee in so far tendering his honour as not to read it out when they once perceived that it touched his majesty footnote i deliver this fact as i find it in a private letter but it is noticed in the journals of the house of commons twenty third juni number four caroly regis sir edward coke reporteth that they find that enclosed in the letter to be unfit for any subject's ear to hear read but one line and a half of it and could not endure to read more of it it was ordered to be sealed and delivered into the king's hands by eight members and to acquaint his majesty with the place and time of finding it particularly that upon reading of one line and a half at most they would read no more but sealed it up and brought it to the house and a footnote others besides the freedom of speech introduced another form a speech without doors which was distributed to the members of the house it is in all respects a remarkable one occupying ten folio pages in the first volume of rushworth some in office appear to have employed extraordinary proceedings of a similar nature 
an intercepted letter written from the archduchess to the king of spain was delivered by sir h martin at the council board on new year's day who found it in some papers relating to the navy the duke immediately said he would show it to the king and accompanied by several lords went into his majesty's closet the letter was written in french it advised the spanish court to make a sudden war with england for several reasons his majesty's want of skill to govern himself the weakness of his council in not daring to acquaint him with the truth want of money disunion of the subjects hearts from their prince etc the king only observed that the writer forgot that the archduchess writes to the king of spain in spanish and sends her letters overland i have to add an important fact i find certain evidence that the heads of the opposition were busily active in thwarting the measures of government dr samuel turner the member for shrewsbury called on sir john cage and desired to speak to him privately his errand was to entreat him to resist the loan and to use his power with others to obtain this purpose the following information comes from sir john cage himself dr turner being desired to stay he would not a minute but instantly took horse saying he had more places to go and time pressed that there was a company of them had divided themselves into all parts every one having a quarter assigned to him to perform this service for the commonwealth this was written in november sixteen twenty six this unquestionably amounts to a secret confederacy watching out of parliament as well as in and those strange appearances of popular defection exhibited in the country which i have described were in great part the consequences of the machinations and active intrigues of the popular party footnote i have since discovered by a manuscript letter that this dr turner was held in contempt by the king that he was ridiculed at court which he haunted for his want of veracity in a word that he was a disappointed courtier and a footnote the king was not disposed to try a third parliament the favourite perhaps to regain that popular favour which his greatness had lost him is said in private letters to have been twice on his knees to intercede for a new one the elections however foreboded no good and a letter-writer connected with the court in giving an account of them prophetically declared we are without question undone the king's speech opens with the spirit which he himself felt but which he could not communicate the times are for action wherefore for example's sake i mean not to spend much time in words if you which god forbid should not do your duties in contributing what the state at this time needs i must in discharge of my conscience use those other means which god hath put into my hands to save that which the follies of some particular men may otherwise hazard to lose he added with the loftiness of ideal majesty take not this as a threatening for i scorn to threaten any but my equals but as an admonition from him that both out of nature and duty hath most care of your preservations and prosperities and in a more friendly tone he requested them to remember a thing to the end that we may forget it you may imagine that i come here with a doubt of success remembering the distractions of the last meeting but i assure you that i shall very easily forget and forgive what is past a most crowded house now met composed of the wealthiest men for a lord who probably considered that property was a true balance of power estimated that they were able to buy the upper house his majesty only accepted the aristocracy of wealth had already begun to be felt some ill omens of the parliament appeared sir robert phillips moved for a general fast we had one for the plague which it pleased god to deliver us from and we have now so many plagues of the commonwealth about his majesty's person that we have need of such an act of humiliation sir edward coke held it most necessary because there are i fear some devils that will not be cast out but by fasting and prayer many of the speeches in this great council of the kingdom are as admirable pieces of composition as exist in the language even the court party were moderate extenuating rather than pleading for the late necessities but the evil spirit of party however veiled 
was walking amidst them all. A letter writer represents the natural state of feelings. Some of the Parliament talked desperately, while others of as high a course to enforce money if they yield not. Such is the perpetual action and reaction of public opinion, when one side will give too little, the other is sure to desire too much. The Parliament granted subsidies. Sir John Cook having brought up the report to the King, Charles expressed great satisfaction, and declared that he felt now more happy than any of his predecessors. Inquiring of Sir John by how many voices he had carried it, Cook replied, but by one, at which his majesty seemed appalled and asked how many were against him. Cook answered, none, the unanimity of the house made all but one voice, at which his majesty wept. If Charles shed tears, or as Cook himself expresses it in his report to the house, was much affected, the emotion was profound, for on all sudden emergencies Charles displayed an almost unparalleled command over the exterior violence of his feelings. The favourite himself sympathised with the tender joy of his royal master, and before the king voluntarily offered himself as a peace sacrifice. In his speech at the council table he entreats the king that he, who had the honour to be his majesty's favourite, might now give up that title to them, a warm, genuine feeling probably prompted these words. To open my heart, please pardon me a word more. I must confess I have long lived in pain. Sleep hath given me no rest, favours and fortune no content. Such have been my secret sorrows to be thought the man of separation, and that divided the king from his people, and them from him but I hope it shall appear they were some mistaken minds that would have made me the evil spirit that walketh between a good master and a loyal people. Buckingham added that for the good of his country he was willing to sacrifice his honours, and since his plurality of offices had been so strongly accepted against, that he was content to give up the master of the horse to Marcus Hamilton, and the warden of the sink ports to the Earl of Carlisle and was willing that the Parliament should appoint another admiral for all services at sea. It is as certain as human evidence can authenticate that on the king's side all was grateful affection, and that on Buckingham's there was a most earnest desire to win the favours of Parliament, and what are stronger than all human evidence, those unerring principles in human nature itself, which are the secret springs of the heart, were working in the breasts of the king and his minister, for neither were tyrannical. The king undoubtedly sighed to meet Parliament with the love which he had at first professed. He declared that he should now rejoice to meet with his people often. Charles had no innate tyranny in his constitutional character, and Buckingham at times was susceptible of misery amidst his greatness, as I have elsewhere shown. It could not have been imagined that the luckless favourite, on the present occasion, should have served as a pretext to set again in motion the chaos of evil. Can any candid mind suppose that the king or the duke meditated the slightest insult on the patriotic party, or would in the least have disturbed the apparent reconciliation? Yet it so happened. Secretary Cook, at the close of his report of the king's acceptance of the subsidies, mentioned that the duke had fervently beseeched the king to grant the house all their desires. Perhaps the mention of the duke's name was designed to ingratiate him into their toleration. Sir John Eliot caught fire at the very name of the duke, and vehemently checked the secretary for having dared to introduce it, declaring that they knew of no other distinction but of king and subjects. By intermingling a subject's speech with the king's message, he seemed to derogate from the honour and majesty of a king. Nor would it become any subject to bear himself in such fashion, as if no grace ought to descend from the king to the people, nor any loyalty ascend from the people to the king, but through him only. This speech was received by many with acclamations. Some cried out, Well spoken, Sir John Eliot! It marks the heated state of the political atmosphere, where even the lightest coruscation of a hated name made it burst into flames. I have often suspected that Sir John Eliot, by his vehement personality, must have borne a personal antipathy to Buckingham. I have never been enabled to ascertain the fact, but
but i find that he has left in manuscript a collection of satires or verses being chiefly invectives against the duke of buckingham to whom he bore a bitter and most inveterate enmity could we sometimes discover the motives of those who first had political revolutions we should find how greatly personal hatreds have actuated them in deeds which have come down to us in the form of patriotism and how often the revolutionary spirit disguises its private passions by its public conduct footnote modern history would afford more instances than perhaps some of us suspect i cannot pass over an illustration of my principle which i shall take from two very notorious politicians watt tyler and sir william walworth modern history would afford more instances than perhaps some of us suspect i cannot pass over an illustration of my principle which i shall take from two very notorious politicians watt tyler and sir william walworth watt when in servitude had been beaten by his master richard lyons a great merchant of wines and a sheriff of london this chastisement working on an evil disposition appears never to have been forgiven and when this radical assumed his short-lived dominion he had his old master beheaded and his head carried before him on the point of a spear so grafton tells us to the eternal obloquy of this arch jacobin who was a crafty fellow and of an excellent wit but wanting grace i would not sully the patriotic blow which ended the rebellion with the rebel yet there are secrets in history sir william walsworth the ever famous mayor of london as stowe designates him has left the immortality of his name to one of our suburbs but having discovered in stowe's survey that walworth was the landlord of the stews on the bank side which he farmed out to the dutch vrouws and which watt had pulled down i am inclined to suspect that private feeling first knocked down the saucy ribald and then thrust him through and through with his dagger and that there was as much of personal vengeance as patriotism which crushed the demolisher of so much valuable property End of footnote. but the supplies which had raised tears from the fervent gratitude of charles though voted were yet withheld they resolved that grievances and supplies go hand in hand the commons entered deeply into constitutional points of the highest magnitude the curious erudition of selden and coke was combined with the ardour of patriots who merit no inferior celebrity though not having consecrated their names by their laborious literature we only discover them in the obscure annals of parliament to our history composed by writers of different principles i refer the reader for the argument of lawyers and the spirit of the commons my secret history is only its supplement the king's prerogative and the subject's liberty were points hard to distinguish and were established but by contest sometimes the king imagined that the house pressed not upon the abuses of power but only upon power itself sometimes the commons doubted whether they had anything of their own to give while their property and their persons seemed equally insecure despotism seemed to stand on one side and faction on the other liberty trembled the conference of the commons before the lords on the freedom and person of the subject was admirably conducted by selden and by coke when the king's attorney affected to slight the learned arguments and precedents pretending to consider them as mutilated out of the records and as proving rather against the commons than for them sir edward coke rose affirming to the house upon his skill in the law that it lay not under mr attorney's cap to answer any one of their arguments selden declared that he had written out all the records from the tower the exchequer and the king's bench with his own hand and would engage his head mr attorney should not find in all these archives a single precedent omitted mr littleton said that he had examined every one syllabatum and whoever said they were mutilated spoke false of so ambiguous and delicate a nature was then the liberty of the subject that it seems they considered it to depend on precedence a startling message on the twelfth of april was sent by the king for dispatch of business the house struck with astonishment desired to have it repeated they remained sad and silent no one cared to open the debate a whimsical politician sir francis nethersole suddenly started up 
entreating leave to tell his last night's dream. Footnote. I have formed my idea of Sir Francis Nethersole from some strange incidents in his political conduct, which I have read in some contemporary letters. He was, however, a man of some eminence, had been a raider for the University of Cambridge, agent for James I, with the princes of the Union in Germany, and also secretary to the Queen of Bohemia. He founded and endowed a free school at Polesworth in Warwickshire. End of footnote some laughing at him he observed that kingdoms had been saved by dreams allowed to proceed he said he saw two good pastures a flock of sheep was in the one and a bellwether alone in the other a great ditch was between them and a narrow bridge over the ditch he was interrupted by the speaker who told him that it stood not with the gravity of the house to listen to dreams but the house was inclined to hear him out the sheep would sometimes go over to the bellwether, or the bellwether to the sheep. Once, both met on the narrow bridge, and the question was who should go back, since both could not go on without danger. One sheep gave counsel that the sheep on the bridge should lie on their bellies, and let the bellwether go over their backs. The application of this dilemma he left to the house. It must be confessed that the bearing of the point was more ambiguous than some of the important ones that formed the matters of their debates. Davis sum non sedipus. It is probable that this fantastical politician did not vote with the opposition, for Elliot, Wentworth, and Coke protested against the interpretation of dreams in the House. When the Attorney General moved that the liberties of the subject might be moderated to reconcile the differences between themselves and the sovereign, sir edward coke observed that the true mother would never consent to the dividing of her child on this buckingham swore that coke intimated that the king his master was the prostitute of the state coke protested against the misinterpretation the dream of nethersole and the metaphor of coke were alike dangerous in parliamentary discussion end of section fifty eight recording by corinne lepage Section 59 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3, by Isaac Disraeli. Secret History of Charles I and His First Parliaments, Part 3. In a manuscript letter, it is said that the House of Commons sat four days without speaking or doing anything. On the 1st of May, Secretary Cook delivered a message, asking whether they would rely upon the King's word. This question was followed by a long silence. Several speeches are reported in the letters of the Times, which are not in Rushworth. Sir Nathaniel Rich observed that, confident that he was of the royal word, what did any indefinite word ascertain? Pym said, We have his majesty's coronation oath to maintain the laws of England. What need we then take his word? He proposed to move whether he should take the king's word or no. This was resisted by Secretary Cook. What would they say in foreign parts if the people of England would not trust their king? He desired the house to call Pym to order, on which Pym replied, Truly, Mr. Speaker, I am just of the same opinion as I was vis-a-vis -vis that the king's oath was as powerful as his word sir john eliot moved that it be put to the question because they that would have it do urge us to that point sir edward coke on this occasion made a memorable speech of which the following passage is not given in rushworth we sit now in parliament and therefore must take his majesty's word no otherwise than in a parliamentary way that is of a matter agreed on by both houses his majesty sitting on his throne in his robes with his crown on his head and sceptre in his hand and in full parliament and his royal assent being entered upon record in perpetuam re memoriam this was the royal word of a king in parliament and not a word delivered in a chamber and out of the mouth of a secretary at the second hand therefore i motion that the house of commons more majorum 
should draw up a petition de draict to his majesty which being confirmed by both houses and assented unto by his majesty will be as firm an act as any not that i distrust the king but that i cannot take his trust but in a parliamentary way footnote these speeches are entirely drawn from those manuscript letters to which i have frequently referred Cokes may be substantially found in rushworth but without a single expression as here given End of footnote. in this speech of sir edward coke we find the first mention in the legal style of the ever memorable petition of right which two days after was finished the reader must pursue its history among the writers of opposite parties on tuesday june fifth a royal message announced that on the eleventh the present sessions would close this utterly disconcerted the commons religious men considered it as a judicial visitation for the sins of the people others raged with suppressed feelings they counted up all the disasters which had of late occurred all which were charged to one man they knew not at a moment so urgent when all their liberty seemed at stake whether the commons should fly to the lords or to the king sir john elliot said that as they intended to furnish his majesty with money it was proper that he should give them time to supply him with counsel he was renewing his old attacks on the duke when he was suddenly interrupted by the speaker who starting from the chair declared that he was commanded not to suffer him to proceed elliot sat down in sullen silence on wednesday sir edward coke broke the ice of the debate that man he said of the duke is the grievance of grievances as for going to the lords he added that is not via regia our liberties are impeached it is our concern on thursday the vehement cry of coke against buckingham was followed up as says a letter writer when one good hound recovers the scent the rest come in with a full cry footnote the popular opinion is well expressed in the following lines preserved in sloane m s eight hundred and twenty six when only one doth rule and guide the ship who neither card nor compass knew before the master pilot and the rest asleep the stately ship is split upon the shore but they awaken start up stare and cry who did this fault not i nor i nor i so fares it with a great and wealthy state not governed by the master but his mate End of footnote. A sudden message from the king absolutely forbade them to asperse any of his majesty's ministers, otherwise his majesty would instantly dissolve them. This felt like a thunderbolt. It struck terror and alarm, and at the instant the House of Commons was changed into a scene of tragical melancholy. All the opposite passions of human nature, all the national evils which were one day to burst on the country, seemed, on a sudden, concentrated in this single spot some were seen weeping some were expostulating and some in awful prophecy were contemplating the future ruin of the kingdom while others of more ardent daring were reproaching the timid quieting the terrified and infusing resolution into the despairing many attempted to speak but were so strongly affected that their very utterance failed them the venerable coke overcome by his feelings when he rose to speak found his learned eloquence falter on his tongue. He sat down, and tears were seen on his aged cheeks. The name of the public enemy of the kingdom was repeated, till the speaker, with tears covering his face, declared he could no longer witness such a spectacle of woe in the commons of England, and requested leave of absence for half an hour. The speaker hastened to the king to inform him of the state of the house. They were preparing a vote against the duke, for being an arch-traitor and an arch-enemy to king and kingdom, and were busied on their remonstrance when the speaker, on his return, after an absence of two hours, delivered his majesty's message that they should adjourn till the next day. This was an awful interval of time. Many trembled for the issue of the next morning. One letter-writer calls it, that black and doleful Thursday, and another, writing before the house met, observes, what we shall expect this morning god of heaven knows we shall meet timely charles probably had been greatly affected by the report of the speaker on the extraordinary state into which the whole house had been thrown 
for on friday the royal message imported that the king had never any intention of barring them from their right but only to avoid scandal that his ministers should not be accused for their counsel to him and still he hoped that all christendom might notice a sweet parting between him and his people this message quieted the house but did not suspend their preparations for a remonstrance which they had begun on the day they were threatened with a dissolution on saturday while they were still occupied on the remonstrance unexpectedly at four o'clock the king came to parliament and the commons were called up charles spontaneously came to reconcile himself to parliament the king now gave his second answer to the petition of right he said my maxim is that the people's liberties strengthen the king's prerogative and the king's prerogative is to defend the people's liberties read your petition and you shall have an answer that i am sure will please you they desired to have the ancient form of their ancestors soit droit fait comme il est désiré and not as the king had before given it with any observation on it charles now granted this declaring that his second answer to the petition in no wise differed from his first but you now see how ready i have shown myself to satisfy your demands i have done my part wherefore if this parliament have not a happy conclusion the sin is yours i am free from it popular gratitude is at least as vociferous as it is sudden both houses returned the king's acclamations of joy every one seemed to exult at the happy change which a few days had effected in the fate of the kingdom everywhere the bells rung bonfires were kindled an universal holiday was kept through the town and spread to the country but an ominous circumstance has been registered by a letter-writer the common people who had caught the contagious happiness imagined that all this public joy was occasioned by the king's consenting to commit the duke to the tower charles had been censured even by hume for his evasions and delays in granting his assent to the petition of right but now either the parliament had conquered the royal unwillingness or the king was zealously inclined on reconciliation yet the joy of the commons did not outlast the bonfires on the streets they resumed their debates as if they had never before touched on the subjects they did not account for the feelings of the man whom they addressed as the sovereign they set up a remonstrance against the duke and introduced his mother into it as a patroness of popery charles declared that after having granted the famous petition he had not expected such a return as this remonstrance how acceptable it is he afterwards said every man may judge no wise man can justify it after the reading of the remonstrance the duke fell on his knees desiring to answer for himself but charles no way relaxed in showing his personal favour the duke was often charged with actions and expressions of which unquestionably he was not always guilty and we can more fairly decide on some points relating to charles and the favourite for we have a clearer notion of them than his contemporaries the active spirits in the commons were resolved to hunt down the game to the death for they now struck out as the king calls it one of the chief maintenances of my crown in tonnage and poundage the levying of which they now declared was a violation of the liberties of the people this subject again involved legal discussions and another remonstrance they were in the act of reading it when the king suddenly came down to the house sent for the speaker and prorogued the parliament i am forced to end this session said charles some few hours before i meant being not willing to receive any more remonstrances to which i must give a harsh answer there was at least as much of sorrow as of anger in this closing speech buckingham once more was to offer his life for the honour of his master and to court popularity it is well known with what exterior fortitude charles received the news of the duke's assassination this imperturbable majesty of his mind insensibility it was not never deserted him on many similar occasions there was no indecision no feebleness in his conduct and that extraordinary event was not suffered to delay the expedition the king's personal industry astonished all the men in office one writes that the king had done more in six weeks than in the duke's time had done in six months the death of buckingham caused no change the king left every man to his own charge but took the general direction into his own hands in private 
Charles deeply mourned the loss of Buckingham. He gave no encouragement to his enemies. The king called him his martyr, and declared the world was greatly mistaken in him, for it was thought that the favourite had ruled his majesty, but it was far otherwise for that the duke had been to him a faithful and obedient servant. Such were the feelings and ideas of the unfortunate Charles I, which it is necessary to become acquainted with to judge of. Few have possessed the leisure or the disposition to perform this historical duty, involved as it is in the history of our passions. If ever the man shall be viewed, as well as the monarch, the private history of Charles I will form one of the most pathetic of biographies. Footnote I have given, volume 2, page 336, The Secret History of Charles I and His Queen, where I have traced the firmness and independence of his character. In another article will be found as much of the secret history of the Duke of Buckingham as I have been enabled to acquire. End of footnote. All the foreign expeditions of Charles I were alike disastrous. The vast genius of Richelieu, at its Meriden, had paled our ineffectual star. The dreadful surrender of Rochelle had sent back our army and navy baffled and disgraced. And Buckingham had timely perished to save one more reproach, one more political crime attached to his name. Such failures did not improve the temper of the times, but the most brilliant victory would not have changed the fate of Charles, nor allied the fiery spirits in the commons, who, as Charles said, not satisfied in hearing complainers, had erected themselves into inquisitors after complaints. Parliament met. The king's speech was conciliatory. He acknowledged that the exaction of the duties of the customs was not a right which he derived from his hereditary prerogative, but one which he enjoyed as the gift of his people. These duties, as yet, had not indeed been formally confirmed by Parliament, but they had never been refused to the sovereign. The king closed with a fervent ejaculation that the session, begun with confidence, might end with a mutual good understanding. Footnote. To conclude, said the king, let us not be jealous one of the other's actions. End of footnote. The shade of Buckingham was no longer cast between Charles I and the Commons, and yet we find that their dread and dear sovereign was not allowed any repose on the throne. The new demon of national discord, religion, in a metaphysical garb, reared its distracted head. This evil spirit had been raised by the conduct of the court divines, whose political sermons, with their attempts to return to the more solemn ceremonies of the Romish church, alarmed some tender consciences. It served as a masked battery for the patriotic party to change their ground at will, without slackening their fire. When the king urged for the duties of his customs, he found that he was addressing a committee sitting for religion. Sir John Eliot threw out a singular expression, alluding to some of the bishops, whom he called masters of ceremonies. He confessed that some ceremonies were commendable, such as that we should stand up at the repetition of the creed to testify the resolution of our hearts to defend the religion we profess and in some churches they did not only stand upright, but with their swords drawn. His speech was a spark that fell into a well-laid train. Scarcely can we conceive the enthusiastic temper of the House of Commons at that moment, when, after some debate, they entered a vow to preserve the Articles of Religion established by Parliament in the thirteenth year of our late Queen Elizabeth, and this vow was immediately followed up by a petition to the king for a fast for the increasing miseries of the reformed churches abroad. Parliaments are liable to have their passions. Some of these enthusiasts were struck by a panic, not perhaps warranted by the danger of Jesuits and Armenians. The king answered them in good humor, observing, however, on the state of the reformed abroad, that fighting would do them more good than fasting, he granted them their fast, but they would now grant no return. For now they presented a declaration to the king that tonnage and poundage must give precedency to religion. The king's answer still betrays no ill temper. He confessed that he did not think that religion was in so much danger as they affirmed. 
he reminds them of tonnage and poundage i do not so much desire it out of greediness of the thing as out of desire to put an end to those questions that arise between me and some of my subjects never had the king been more moderate in his claims or more tender in his style and never had the commons been more fierce and never in truth so utterly inexorable often kings are tyrannical and sometimes are parliaments a body corporate with the infection of passion may perform acts of injustice equally with the individual who abuses the power with which he is invested it was insisted that charles should give up the receivers of the customs who were denounced as capital enemies to the king and kingdom while those who submitted to the duties were declared guilty as accessories when sir john eliot was pouring forth invectives against some courtiers however they may have merited the blast of his eloquence he was sometimes interrupted and sometimes cheered for the stinging personalities the timid speaker refusing to put the question suffered a severe reprimand from selden if you will not put it we must sit still and thus we shall never be able to do anything the house adjourned in great heat the dark prognostic of the next meeting which sir simmons dues has remarked in his diary as the most gloomy sad and dismal day for england that happened for five hundred years on this fatal day the speaker still refusing to put the question and announcing the king's command for adjournment sir john eliot stood up footnote monday second of march sixteen twenty nine and a footnote the speaker attempted to leave the chair but two members who had placed themselves on each side forcibly kept him down eliot who had prepared a short declaration flung down a paper on the floor crying out that it might be read his party vociferated for the reading others that it should not a sudden tumult broke out coriton a fervent patriot struck another member and many laid their hands on their swords footnote it was imagined out of doors that swords had been drawn for a welsh page running in great haste when he heard the noise to the door cried out i pray you let her in let her in to give her master his sword manuscript letter and a footnote shall we said one be sent home as we were last sessions turned off like scattered sheep the weeping trembling speaker still persisting in what he held to be his duty was dragged to and fro by opposite parties but neither he nor the clerk would read the paper though the speaker was bitterly reproached by his kinsman sir peter hayman as the disgrace of his country and a blot to a noble family Eliot, finding the house so strongly divided, undauntedly snatching up the paper, said, I shall then express that by my tongue which this paper should have done. Denzel Halls assumed the character of speaker, putting the question. It was returned by the acclamations of the party. The doors were locked and the keys laid on the table. The king sent for the sergeant and mace, but the messenger could obtain no admittance. The usher of the black rod met no more regard. The king then ordered out his guard, in the meanwhile the protest was completed. The door was flung open, the rush of the members was so impetuous that the crowd carried away among them the sergeant and the usher in the confusion and riot. Many of the members were struck by horror amidst this conflict. It was a sad image of the future. Several of the patriots were committed to the tower. The king, on dissolving this parliament, which was the last till the memorable long parliament, gives us at least his idea of it it is far from me to judge all the house alike guilty for there are there as dutiful subjects as any in the world it being but some few vipers among them that did cast this mist of undutifulness over most of their eyes footnote at the time many undoubtedly considered that it was a mere faction of the house sir simmons dues was certainly no politician but unquestionably his ideas were not peculiar to himself of the last third parliament he delivers this opinion in his diary i cannot deem but the greater part of the house were morally honest men but these were the least guilty of the fatal breach being only misled by some other machiavellian politics who seemed zealous for the liberty of the commonwealth and by that means in the moving of their outward freedom drew the votes of those good men to their side 
End of footnote. Thus I have traced, step by step, the secret history of Charles I and his early parliaments. I have entered into their feelings, while I have supplied new facts, to make everything as present and as true as my faithful diligence could repeat the tale. It was necessary that I should sometimes judge of the first race of our patriots as some of their contemporaries did, but it was impossible to avoid correcting these notions by the more enlarged views of their posterity. This is the privilege of an historian and the philosophy of his art. There is no apology for the king, nor any declamation for the subject. Were we only to decide by the final results of this great conflict, of which what we have here narrated is but the faint beginning, we should confess that Sir John Eliot and his party were the first fathers of our political existence, and we should not withhold from them the inexpressible gratitude of a nation's freedom. But human infirmity mortifies us in the noblest pursuits of man, and we must be taught this penitential and chastising wisdom. The story of our patriots is involved. Charles appears to have been lowering those high notions of his prerogative which were not peculiar to him, and was throwing himself on the bosom of his people. The severe and unrelenting conduct of Sir John Eliot, his prompt eloquence and bold invective, well fitted him for the leader of a party. He was the lodestone, drawing together the loose particles of iron, never sparing in the monarch the errors of man, never relinquishing his royal prey, which he had fastened on, Eliot, with Dr. Turner and some others, contributed to make Charles disgusted with all parliaments. Without any dangerous concessions, there was more than one moment when they might have reconciled the sovereign to themselves, and not have driven him to the fatal resource of attempting to reign without a parliament. Footnote. Since the publication of the present article, I have composed my Commentaries on the Life and Reign of Charles I in five volumes. End of footnote. End of section 59. Recording by Corinne LePage.